Well, let's welcome our Steve as he comes to share with us. Thank you, David. Glad the clapping happened before. Sarah has a beautiful smile, doesn't she? Sarah was in my son Jonathan's year down at uh, Trinity about 14 years ago. And the smile is still the same. And uh, what was it? <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> She'll let me know what the preaching is like when I get home. She'll say, what about this and what about that and what about the other? And uh, she's my best critic. I want to congratulate Margot because she became an Australian citizen last Friday. She's been deliberating for 49 years. <laughs> so I do have a photograph and it went on the uh, collective chat. And uh, I see Ben and Sarah sometimes down at Hammer and Tong. When I walk past, I walk past but they're in there and some of the music that comes out of that place, it is so loud. But I saw a couple of girls running up the street with medicine balls yesterday. I just don't know how they do it, but uh, anyway, they're very good. I want to thank uh, Alan for the opportunity of preaching. And uh, I just... Did the Titans win last night? Titans didn't win. Isn't that Jackie's favourite team? No, Roosters. <laughs> Roosters. So Roosters beat them? Was it Roosters that beat the Titans? So she's happy. Oh, I thought she might be sad because she backed the Titans. Anyway, I'm a Queenslander, born and bred in Brisbane, and um, so I'm a Broncos follower, Reds, Maroons, whatever, and uh, love coming out of Brisbane, love coming out of Queensland, beautiful one day, glorious the next, they say, but it's been a long time since uh, I've been up there. I do want to uh, tell Alan, when he gets to watch this, that... At the end of May, I was asked by a friend to preach in his church. He is a Uniting Church minister, he used to be here in Lismore. And he said, Steve, I'm going on holidays. Would you mind coming up and preaching for me one Sunday while I'm away? I said, sure. He said he was going to sail up to Darwin or somewhere. So anyway, I preached in his Uniting Church. And uh, it's on YouTube up there. And that night, he phoned me. And he said, well, how'd you go? I said, well, half your church walked out. I said, with a bit of luck, you might get half of those back again. And he said, well, I watched you. I said, whereabouts are you? He said, I'm in Fiji. I said, you watched on YouTube from Fiji? Yes, he did. So uh, a pastor on holidays, not letting the church go, and just watching on YouTube from Fiji how the service went. So there we go. Uh, he actually is a very good preacher. And the week before I went up there, he said to me, Steve, if you want to see how long I preach for, just watch me on YouTube. So I watched him on YouTube, and he was preaching on the Holy Spirit. And he did an excellent job, an excellent job on the Holy Spirit in the Uniting Church. About halfway through, he started talking about these um, strange charismatics who speak in tongues. And I thought, Gary, you've asked me to preach the week before Pentecost, and I'm a Pentecostal pastor. And so, uh, anyway... So anyway, we had a good time up there. And so it's good to have the opportunity of coming and uh, sharing something that is on my heart. I think that um, uh, Al is an excellent preacher, is a great evangelist and a great teacher. But I thought this morning I'd wear something I'm more comfortable with in some sense, and that's more the pastoral hat. So I want to bring a little bit from the shepherd's hat, so to speak, this morning. Anyway, let's pray. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come. I know you're already here. I thank you, Lord, that you've been here even before we set up this morning. And I ask today, Lord, that as I share, as I share from your word, Lord, that there's going to be something for everybody here. And I pray that it'll go beyond these four walls in the spirit. And Lord, that uh, we'll take something that's in our own spirits today and share it when we go out. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A long time ago, I went to a charismatic meeting in Los Angeles. And uh, the reason I went is because there are a lot of charismatic teachers, preachers that you would know, people like Bill Johnson, people like uh, Heidi and Roland Baker, and a whole list of people. And I thought, what a great opportunity. So I hopped on a plane, went over there. 
landed in Los Angeles, booked into a motel, and uh, I was on one side of the city. There's a road going straight through over the highway and uh, into Pasadena, into Cheyenne's church. And so I went there, and uh, because it was a charismatic meeting and they were so uh, long, I organised, or my motel organised, for a taxi to pick me up after the meeting and then bring me back across Los Angeles. And so that's what I did every night. And so one night it was Heidi Baker who was preaching and she got up on stage and uh, first thing she did was kneel down. Now kneeling is not good for Pentecostals. We don't like that. We like, we like this sort of thing. And, uh, but she knelt. And then of course there's a little bit of movement, a little bit of discomfort and then she'd just say, wait. So we'd wait for about 30 seconds and then we'd start to move, get uncomfortable and then she'd said, wait. So we did as best we could. There's a couple of thousand people there and of course there's a little bit of a movement <clears throat> when she's going to start the preaching and she'd just say, wait. So after a while she got up and she preached and uh, Sometimes through that message, a thought went through my mind, which I tried to get out of my mind as quickly as possible because I thought, this is the devil. Because the thought was, your taxi's not going to come tonight. I thought, that's no good. Forget about it. So after the meeting was over, I waited outside the church, which is where I was going to meet the taxi. And the taxi was a few minutes late, and I waited. And then I thought, this is not good. I waited a little bit longer. A little bit longer... I was getting impatient. It had gone past midnight, I think, by this time. And so I started to say, God, I've got to go because there's a long way across the city if this taxi doesn't come. I have to walk a long way. And so I waited. And then I said to the Lord, two more minutes and that's it. I'm walking. And so I waited two more minutes and then I started to walk. I went into a dark street. I went up onto a road that went over the freeway. And uh, it was very loud. I can still remember the noise. And uh, I walked along that road and there was no traffic. But before I got onto the bridge, a car came past and it stopped about 30 metres away. And I thought, oh, what will I do? I stopped, it stopped, and it started to back back towards me. And I thought, this is not good. Headlines. Three big burly men get out of a car, kidnap an Australian pastor never seen again. And so I just stayed there. I was frozen. And it came all the way back. And then a window wound down and a female voice, a woman's voice came out and said, Steve. I thought, heck, nobody knows me. Nobody knows my name. I've come from overseas. And she said, Steve, we met you on the first day of the conference over a cup of tea. And we thought that was you. We will take you wherever you want to go. And uh, I hopped in the car, no argument. And so they dropped me off back at my motel. Now, I've never forgotten that entire night, but what I've never forgotten was two people, two pastors, who came from a little village, upstate somewhere, a very small village, with a congregation of six people. And they stopped for the one. They stopped for the one. You know, one of the things that pastors get a lot of delight out of is Sunday morning when they see people moving around the auditorium and they go up to people and they greet them and they spend some time with them. And certainly after a service, when there are people and they're visitors or they might be, well, I, I think they're looking a bit lonely. It might be a teenager who's sitting by themselves. But sometimes you will find, and it is so gratifying to a pastor to see people walk up and begin to converse and begin to ask empathetic, sensitive questions of people and maybe even invite them out for a coffee. And so that's a lovely thing to see because you know that you don't have to worry about it as pastor because you're often taken up with something else. But you have people in the congregation who are moving around and they have a heart. It's not that they're on a roster or anything, but they just have a heart for people and to see that people are being included I walk with three guys three mornings a week and uh, we're nothing alike really. We're chalk and cheese in many respects. But if they had the opinion that we all had to be the same, then I would feel perhaps that I wasn't fitting in. One of them started going to one church. 
After a while, another one went to the same church. And after a while, the third one went to the same church. And uh, I made up my mind that I wasn't going to go to the same church because I wanted to bring something different to the table. When we got together, I wanted to have something fresh. Now, they don't gossip about their church. They have some uh, funny little things that happen, and we have a good laugh about those things. But we don't gossip and talk about church very much at all, in fact. But to belong to that group, if I had to think the same way, go to the same church, maybe get the same sort of... You ever had a son who has grown up in soccer? They might start under 10 and then they get through like my Jonathan does to Prems and he's been there for the last, I don't know how many years. But, you know, they get so tempted to talk the same lingo and you hear things coming out of the mouth and you think, where do they get that from? Or they're with their friends and they're listening to jokes which aren't very palatable and uh, they want to fit in. They want to fit in there rather than being themselves. And so there's a difference between being allowed to be who you are or will I crumble and fit in and adopt some of the methods, some of the uh, mannerisms that they have just to fit in. I've asked Luke to put up a sentence up here, not that one, Luke. It's to do with belonging. Here we go. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. Any belonging that asks us to betray ourselves is not true belonging. So if I felt that I had to be like these men and I had to talk about their church, if there was talking about their church and agree with their criticisms and all of that stuff, that wouldn't be who I am. I belong when I feel that I can be who I am. I can imagine if uh, Rob Anderson here got a group of uh, eighth graders And they got together and Rob said, okay, for devotion this morning, what I want you to do is to get together in a group of five and then come up with a poster. And on the poster, you will state the difference between fitting in and being who you are. And so we've got some of those up there uh, from the eighth graders. These aren't from Summerland, but could very well be. Eighth graders posters on the difference between belonging and fitting in. And going down a bit further, thanks, Luke. So one of the posters was this. This is actual eighth graders. Belonging is being accepted for you. In other words, you can come into our group, we'll accept you the way that you are. Fitting in is being accepted for being like everyone else. You're like all of us here. We speak the same, we dress the same, we have the same lingo and all of those things. Now you belong, but you're just fitting in. And the second one, Luke... If I get to be me, I belong. If I have to be like you, I fit in. If I get to be me, I belong. If I have to be like you, I fit in. And so it's important to understand the difference, I think, between being allowed to be who we are, this is me, this is Steve C, or do I want to belong and therefore I will do whatever they're doing. I will change who I feel I really am. And, uh, and so I think it's important that we understand some of these uh, concepts. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Alan was talking and he said, um, what did he say? He said, how many people do you think are in Lismore? And he came up with a number about 40,000, and that's pretty accurate. On the 30th of June last year, the actual, apparently, population of Lismore was 44,200. This year it was predicted to be on the 30th of June, 45,100, an increase of about 900. Now in the last year or so you get different statistics. For example, I've heard that 7,000 people actually left Lismore. I've heard that 4,000 people were living or didn't live because their homes were uninhabitable. And so you get uh, these situations and uh, I wonder how people are feeling how people are feeling, really, when we look at the city. Margot and I own 11 acres. You can't do anything with the 11 acres. It's on the Woodlawn Road. But we have two horses there that Margot loves. She feeds them more than she feeds me. Uh, She loves the horses. She talks to them. She does all sorts of wonderful things with the horses. 
I go out there and I mow their poo. That's my, that's my use. But we love going away and being out there. Either we go separately or we go together and we can just be alone. Now, Jesus went, the Bible says, into lonely places so he could be alone so that he could pray. Sometimes he prayed all night. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. How do you pray all night? But Jesus went to lonely places and prayed all night. We go to a lonely place and we come back and we're refreshed. But you have a lot of people out there, and Alan asked the question, if there are 2,000 people in church, there must be something like 38,000 people who aren't in church. And, uh, and I start asking the question, and I ask it really of churches as well, how many lonely people are in Lismore? And how, how many lonely people do we actually have in church? Now, you get a lot of great testimonies about what happened after COVID, as a result of COVID, churches uh, getting their numbers up, and uh, the same with the floods. And there's a lot of great testimonies. But when you're a pastor, sometimes you just come across people, and it's sad when you find them in churches. One lady went to a church, and she said she sat there for four Sundays in a row, sat in a pew, and not one person came up to greet her in four Sundays. Or ask her a question. Do you think she went back to the church? Another lady asked for prayer recently and she said, uh, Steve, would you pray for me? I said, what can we pray for? And she just burst into tears. And she said, I'm so lonely. I'm lonely because I had a lot of people who said that they loved me and that they'd be in touch with me and none of them ever did. So we prayed. And I kid you not, after the amen, her mobile phone went off and she read the phone and she said, God just answered our prayer. I've got a friend who said, I've been thinking about you and I just wondered if you'd like to go for a walk with me in one of the national parks. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Luke has a few more scriptures up there. I better quote some scriptures, otherwise Alan will rouse on me. John 14:2. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And so Jesus is saying sometime in the future, we'll be going there and it's called my father's house. It's father's house. It's not my house. It's father's house. But in 1 Peter chapter, I think, it's, is it chapter 2? 1 Peter chapter 2 says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In your footnotes in your Bible, you might see that we are being built into a spiritual house in which God dwells by his spirit. Now you start putting some scriptures together and you get this idea, I do, that when the Trinity starts talking about house, they're talking about the Father, they're talking about Jesus, who is the living stone, He's the, he's the cornerstone, he's the rock on which it's built, and you've got the Holy Spirit who dwells there. It seems to me that the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are very wrapped up into community. In other words, they're talking about house. And Luke, there's a final scripture there that I want to run off. Um, Psalm 68. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds, rejoice before him, his name is the Lord. And it goes a little bit further. It says, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. And here's the line. God sets the lonely in families. God sets the lonely in families. Do you know in the Bible, in the New Testament, there are 101 and others in the New Testament. 59 of them are specific about how we can act towards one another. But God sets the lonely in families. He sets the lonely in families. Now, you may be here this morning, and you, in actual fact, even though there's a smile on your face and you sang the choruses, you may be lonely on the inside. I understand that. I understand that. I think there are a lot of people in churches who are actually lonely. There are a lot of people on the outside who obviously are lonely. But God's desire is that within the family, we find room for one another. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. People belonging to God. And we belong to one another. Not in a weird sort of way, but when we come here, we should be able to 
Find people. And I'd love to hear Margot talk on this one day. How do you actually communicate with people? How do you communicate with people in such a way that they will feel this person really is interested in me, they d just don't want a bum on a seat next Sunday. When my s eldest son, Matthew, went to Brisbane, I sent him to a large charismatic church, I mean a big charismatic church, and uh, had a great preacher there. And some time later I said to Matt, Matt, how are you going with that church? He said, Dad, I didn't go for very long because all they wanted was bums on seats, as long as you turned up every Sunday. And you know, the church has been through years like that when we just, particularly as pastors, you'd go to pastors' conferences and you'd say, how big's your church? How many people's in your church? And I remember a guy, he used to be COC down in Ballina, he said to the state leader, he said, it's all right for you guys, you're in big towns. And he said back to him, he said, hey mate, he said, big men build big churches. I wasn't really impressed with that because... I've been in very small churches, but gee, you had to labour for 10 years before you see fruit. These days, a congregation of 100 people, these days, a congregation of 100 people who worship for a whole year together are seeing one person added. The church has been in decline for many years in this nation. And so obviously there are things that we can improve on. I want to give you an example of where Jesus set somebody into his group, into his group. And a um, little bit of imagination. On the western shore of Lake Galilee, there's a town called Magdala. And this happened a few years before Jesus was born. Magdala is known for the processing of fish, was then. And so, if you can imagine in your imagination. It's at night and you'll hear a man coughing and he's coughing so much you think this man's future doesn't seem to be that good. He's coughing so much it doesn't sound good. And so a little daughter runs into him and says, Papa, I can't sleep. And he says, why can't you sleep? And so the th second thing I noted was that it was a father who wasn't very fit and healthy. Where was the mother? Maybe the mother had gone. But the daughter runs in and says, I can't sleep. And he says, why can't you sleep? And she says, I'm scared. And so he says, what do we do when we're scared? And uh, she says, we say the words. What words? The words. And the dad says, from the prophet Isaiah. From the prophet Isaiah. And he begins to say the words from the prophet Isaiah. And then he says to his little daughter, I love it when you say the words. Will you say the words for me? I'm going to read the words that the dad read, if I can find them. Here we go. Isaiah 43. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Years later, this little girl no longer has parents. She's obviously lonely. You'd be lonely. Her name isn't what it was when she was a child. Now they're calling her Lily. Lily or Lilith. I could only find one reference to the word Lilith in the Bible. They don't actually use that word Lilith in the context. And again, it's in Isaiah. But uh, it says this, Isaiah 34 verse 14. This is the meaning of the word. It's not the actual word Lilith. It's the meaning of Lilith. It says, there the night creatures will also lie down. Night creatures. They're calling her a night creature. In uh, Middle Eastern mythology, they used to call Lilith a possessed person, 
a demonized person. Now you have a young girl who's grown up without parents. She's got no way of supporting herself. And so she sells herself. She sells herself. And so now, obviously, she's full of shame. She's lonely. Nobody to support her. And uh, we're going to watch a clip. It's going to be a little bit hard to see, but I want us to watch it to see what happens. What happens when Jesus comes on the situation to this person and how he sets them in his little group. If you want to watch that, it's The Chosen Season 1, Episode 1, and it's about the 59th minute through, I think. Unfortunately, we've just got too much light. What does Jesus do? He takes Lilith and he says, I have redeemed you and I've called you by name. And uh, he calls her by her birth name, which is Mary. And you and I obviously know her as Mary Magdalene. And so what he does is he takes her, takes the shame away. And now he begins to deal with the loneliness by he takes her and he will bring her in to his own disciples. Who did Jesus appear to after his resurrection? First one was Mary of Magdala. Mary of Magdala. He takes her, he gives her her name back, he has redeemed her and he sets her in his own little family. And so I come back and I, and I ask the question again, how many lonely people are there in Lismore? How many lonely people are there in our churches? If we are thirsty, we take a drink. If we are hungry, we eat. If we are lonely, it means that we need company. It means that we need people. We are not rugged individuals meant to go through life alone and prove our manliness by not leading anybody. If you have a look at Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and so it starts at we need the basic things to be housed in, and then it comes up in a triangle. And right at the very top it says self-actualization. You and I know that as God. But halfway up his triangle where he's telling us what the needs are is love and belonging. Love and belonging. Can you see that one halfway up? Friendship, family, intimacy, sense of connection. If you are lonely, it means that we need love and we need belonging. Just like you are thirsty and you need water, or if you're hungry and you need food, if you're lonely, it means that you need to have social connection. You were, you were born to need social connection. If we do not have social connection, you know your 45% chance of dying earlier if we don't have so if we are lonely loneliness spawns things like anxiety depression cardiovascular disease dementia all of those nasties and it comes back be, not all of those you know, I'm just saying that if you're lonely it can lead to those things all right so don't get it the wrong way around but we do need love and belonging and uh, this is a great place to do it but we do need people who Know how to ask questions. Know how to ask questions. Know how to delve a little bit deeper. Know how to be empathetic. Not, how you going, mate? Good? That doesn't cut it. Doesn't cut it. Not according to Abraham Maslow. Love and belonging are halfway up that scale. We all need love and belonging. We all need love and belonging. No man or no woman is an island unto themselves. We weren't created to be like that. We are created to need people and to be of help to other people. And so I just want to come around full circle to my little trip into Los Angeles. There I was on a dark road in a foreign country. Nobody knew my name. He knew my name. And he made sure that two people who would stop for the one knew my name. Two people over a cup of tea and they remembered my name, but he was in it. Steve, that was my name. And they took me where I needed to go to. 
The thing about talking to people is this. 20 or 30 years ago, you could get away with the hard sell. You need to know Jesus. Do you want to give your life to Jesus? Yes, sign on the dotted line. We'll give you a track. Come to church next Sunday. Doesn't cut it anymore. Doesn't cut it anymore. We can't wave our fingers in people's faces and say, you ought to know Jesus. You ought to love Jesus. You ought to love Jesus. How about showing them a Jesus and then they will feel that they ought to love him by the way that you and I show people Jesus. If people see the real Jesus, if people can see the authentic, real Jesus, the natural response is to give their lives to him if we can show him the real Jesus. Not a name off a page, not a name that we've learnt, but in here, we know him. We know him. I'm still on that journey. I'm sure you are too. Do we know him that well that we can share him from the words that we speak, the actions that we take, the things that we do, and people will say there's more to it than all of this. It's not just words. It's about a person. It's about a person. I'll leave you with one more thought. The church does not have a mission. The church does not have a mission. God's mission has a church. The church doesn't have a mission. But God's mission has a church. Argue with that until you find it's true. You and I are the church. We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God. Once we were not a people, now we are the people of God, that we may bring him praise. We are a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. My heart struggles sometimes when I see people who are maybe elevated to a place of... Uh, elders or deacons or whatever. And, uh, you know, you can have lines out the front. And my heart doesn't like that very much because I think we're a royal priesthood. The Bible says the believer shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It says the believer. It doesn't say just the pastor or just the deacons or just the elders. It says we all are royal priests. We're all being fitted together like living stones. We're all as capable. It's just that we have different gifts. But I value yours as much as you would value whatever mine is. And I need you and you need me. And the only way this place will work is when we realise that we are living stones being fitted together and uh, you know, we don't have this sort of up-down structure. We're living stones. We are living stones working together. I enjoy the musicians. I enjoyed Ben, Nick, David, Annalise, Annalise, can't spell it right. I'm sorry I haven't met the bass player. Who's the bass player? What's your name? Jasper. Jasper. I'm Steve. I'll know your name next time. Jasper. But let's get beyond how you're going, mate. There's a lot more to life than that. I hope someday you get to hear my wife talk about how do we communicate with one another. How do we communicate? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you know every person's name in this place. You have a destiny for all of us. You have places where we can fit in. And Lord, where we can be living stones with one another. I pray that as a rise grows, Lord, that we all find our place here. We find our place in society. And Lord, we will learn if there's one important point from today, it's this, to stop for the one. Because unless we stop for the one, it's not going to happen. Lord, it's like a butterfly that flies past us. We just have to reach out and say, God, you're speaking to me and you've told me to stop for the one. Now, Lord... Show this person Jesus through me. I don't have to preach to them. 
I just have to be Jesus, as it were, to them. So we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.